Most of the great cities in the world are tourist meccas, drawing hordes of visitors, getting written up in travel magazines, and being featured on a number of television shows as a backdrop to the storyline. But occasionally, one runs across a treasure that is yet to be widely acclaimed and that is truly a great find and can lead to some of the best travel experiences imaginable. Jaslemere is one of those rare finds. Join us today as we remove the veil from one of the truly wondrous cities of the world, Jaslemere, India's hidden gem. Namaste. I'm Bill Ball, and I'm going to be your guide on this episode of Journeys in India. And this is India. Well, we've got an adventure and a half for you today. We're going to visit the city of Jaisalmer, the only living fortified city in all of India. And then it's to the Tar Desert. We're going to learn how the people and the wildlife live in what seems an insurmountable odds. And finally, we're going to learn to cook a couple of Rajasthani dishes. So it's time. So let's get going. But where to get going? Jaisalmer doesn't make it on all or even many tourist itineraries, which quite frankly is a shame. It is one of those most unique cities of the world. Jaisalmer is located in the state of Rajasthan at the edge of the Tar Desert. Tar, by the way, means abode of death, which might be the reason it doesn't end up on many Indian itineraries. But it has actually been on a traveler's itineraries for centuries as this city was a wayside on the Silk Road. To the early camel caravans of the Silk Road era, the site of Jaisalmer Fort must have been both foreboding and welcoming. Welcoming in the sense that they knew they could get supplies after weeks in the desert. Foreboding because they knew they would have to pay taxes just to pass through the area. But in either case, this was the first step in foreigners visiting this magnificent city. We're kind of jumping ahead of ourselves here. The first step for Silk Road traders or modern tourists is getting to Jaisalmer, and that's not easy. The nearest airport is in Jodhpur, which is 287 kilometers or 178 miles away. You could take the train for 10 hours. Second class is hard benches, so beware, or a public bus, which is even more rustic, but can make for great stories later. Or best of all, hire a driver as we did. The cost is relatively minimal and provides great comfort and a quicker ride. Even if you hire a driver, don't be tempted to drive from Jodhpur straight to Jaisalmer. There is much going on along the road and it would be a shame to miss any part of real life India that is all around you. Local markets spring up in many of the small villages that are located strategically on this lifeline of commerce once called the Silk Road, and now simply the highway. These little markets carry a wide range of goods to cover the needs of both village dwellers and the nearby farmers. Talking of farmers, the markets have every kind of locally grown produce fresh off the vine tree or bush. From cucumbers to mangoes, to gunda, a Rajasthani specialty, to eggplant or bringle as it is known here. The market may not look fancy, but the shoppers are fussy and only the best, freshest produce is sold. Markets aren't the only reason to take your time following the road to Jaisalmer. Probably the best reason to slow down is to people watch. Rajasthan is a diverse mix of people and nowhere is that more evident than here. Tribes, ethnic groups, city folk and farmers all mix, creating the colorful fabric of life that is India. The last reason for stopping is the oldest, to buy something unique. I can't pass up on an opportunity to own an art piece or an artifact that adds a little spice to my collection. Our driver knows some people in a village along the way and suggests that we stop. This is one of the joys of traveling with a tour group or with a professional guide, interaction with the locals. What I didn't expect was to become part of the village so quickly. One of the huts had some structural damage and had to be fixed. Another hand to lift the roof was needed, so I joined in. I guess it's always good to have a fallback career. This little village was planning a special event, a wedding, 
and this is the blushing bride-to-be. The parents' house is specially decorated for the wedding with a traditional floor painting. The parents sit on one side of the design while the bride and groom sit on the other. To visit a Rajput village and be part of their lives, if only briefly, is a privilege and should not be taken lightly. If you get a chance to visit a traditional village, always ask for permission before entering huts or photographing the people. Most welcome you like a long lost friend or even family. This is what travel is all about, connections. I was invited inside the guest house to take a look at its construction. Like many of the homes in the village, the walls are half clay and half manure with sticks and straws used as a binding material. Surprisingly sturdy, waterproof and cool, I was half thinking of staying until I realized that dinner, lunch and even breakfast would be millet, their main crop. My very carnivorous stomach wasn't really excited about that. It wasn't long after we left the Rajput village that we arrived at our hotel. Mirvana Nature Resort is a luxury tented camp, but that really doesn't do it justice. These royal shikar tents have been handcrafted using natural local materials. The tents are on raised marble platforms with both cooling for the hot desert days and heating for the cool desert nights. They have private bathrooms and 24-hour hot and cold water and electricity. The luxury doesn't end there. A high-end modern dining hall is provided for guests and a lovely pool beckons the would-be swimmer. Since Mirvana is actually set on a working farm, the food is organic with fresh dairy and poultry products. Even a carnivore can appreciate that. I was lucky enough to catch the resort's manager and daughter of the founder. I had heard the resort was eco-friendly and helped the local villages, and I needed to know the meaning behind its name, Mirvana. First off, when we drove in, I noticed we drove through what looked like a farm. Um, is that correct? Is this surrounded by a farm? Yes, the resort is actually surrounded by a farm. The farm is 109 acres, and the resort is a part of the farm. That's where it gets its name from, Mirvana Nature Resort. What is Mirvana? Mirvana is basically an illusion. We have used two words, Mirvana, Mirvana becomes Nirvana and Mirage. So we want our guests to experience Nirvana in a Mirage. What kind of things are grown here on the farm? On the farm we have a lot of herbal and medicinal plants. We, have, uh, we grow some continental vegetables of our own. We grow Aesop gold. We grow Amla, which is an Indian gooseberry. Wheat, some rice and we grow some vegetables that we use as well in the resort. What got the idea for the resort? How did you come up with an idea for resort? My father was a hotelier. He, did, um, he was in this business for 30 years. He took an early retirement and came back and he thought he would start a farm and do something for this area. After playing golf and trying to take care of agriculture for three years, he realized that he was missing the industry and he wanted to get back into it. So he started with pitching some tents and then he was enjoying the guests and their company and seeing so many people from different parts of the world. Also for him it gave him some pleasure to see, uh, see himself being a part of their, uh, you know, those happy days and their holidays. So that encouraged him to go on and develop the entire resort. So that's how it started and now the entire family is taking care of this business. Now I've been uh, walking around I've noticed that there are solar panels up in different places. Mm -hmm. Obviously. You're trying to take advantage of the sun. Um, you're doing some eco-friendly things here, mm -hmm. also with water too. Tell me about that. We are uh, we're very recently trying to go go completely solar. We started with the water, hot water, instead of having uh, geysers and electric other electric devices to he heat the water. We did uh, we did the solar system to heat the water, and another was we had boilers which you burn wood fire to use. Uh, to use to heat the water. So we have both of them which are both very eco-friendly and uh, we are conserving water in the farms. We use drip irrigation and sprinklers only. That controls the water and the plant gets as much water, only as much water as they need. So no water is really being wasted. 
What we've done is we also use the water, reuse the water that has been used in all the rooms. They go separately into another tank, which is around 30 feet deep. The water is recycled over there and it is used again for the farm after some time. We're doing that with the water in the swimming pool as well. I also noticed the other night we, you know, we went on a, a nature safari with the vehicles and there's quite a bit of wildlife in this area. Mm -hmm. um, you would think that this is a desert, nothing can survive, but that's obviously not true. The desert uh, has its own kind of animals and we have our own fauna as well over here. Some of the, the commonly sighted animals over here you'd see are some endangered species. There's some birds, also migratory birds that come this side in the winters. We have the desert fox, cat. There are a lot of uh, reptiles as well that are very significant to this area. We have uh, deer, then the blue uh, nil guy, which is the black bug over here, chinkaras, different kinds of birds that migrate here are kurja. We have some bulbuls, we have godawan, the great Indian bustard. So it's, it, it's good, you can see a lot of wildlife as well over here. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's remarkable. I only had one thing left for the day, get some shut-eye. Tomorrow would be a very full day exploring Jozelmir and the desert around us. My local guide told me that we had something special to see before we entered the great city walls. I was beginning to wonder if I would ever get to Jozelmir, but boy was I glad I listened and took the short detour. I have seen a lot in my travels around the world, but this is something not to be missed. First of all, let me tell you what this is. It is called the Garsar Tank. Located about a half a mile from the fort, it played primarily the most vital role in the life of the city. This natural depression was dammed to collect and save every valuable raindrop. Remember, we are in a hot, dry desert, and water is what makes or breaks a city here. Until 1965, this lake was the town's main source of water, and ladies in lovely saris would come twice a day, morning and afternoon, to fetch water. The Garisar tank is named for the far-sighted ruler, Marawaho Garisar, who in 1367 built it for the town. Not to say he and his family didn't use it too. He constructed a special balcony over the lake so he could have boat rides during the monsoon season. Hey, why let water go to waste? Because of the importance of water, along the banks of the tank are several temples, mostly dedicated to Vishnu and Lord Shiva. This temple, for instance, is for Shiva. The worshippers ring the bell to awaken the gods before entering the inner sanctum. Here, prayers and meditation are the order of the day. The entrance gate for the temple area has a very interesting story attached to it. This gate, known as the Tilan Gate, was named for a famous court dancer and concubine. She was able to save a small fortune by, it was said, using her charm and expressive dances for the Maharaja. She used some of the money to construct a gate to the tank. The queens of the court were furious that a dancer who was equated with the lower classes, would have paid for a gate that royalty had to cross. The ladies of the court pressured. The Maharaja ordered its destruction. But Telan was not to be outdone by the queens. She consulted the holy men or Brahmins who gave her a solution. Put a statue of Vishnu on the top of the gateway and it couldn't be torn down. She did, and the gate remains to this day. I know what you're thinking. Pretty cool architecture. Nice historic site with a fascinating tale of a court dancer. But with the buildup I gave it, there has to be more. Well, there is. The tank has a large, well, more like gigantic population of catfish. They are unbelievable in numbers, size, and voracious appetite. Feeding them is considered good luck, so I should be set for the rest of the trip. These fish are really something. No matter where you come from, whether you're native Indian or foreign visitor, 
there is one sight that won't fail to amaze you, the Joslemir Fort. The statistics alone will astound you. It stands 250 feet above the surrounding country with 99 stone bastions rising 30 plus feet above the hill built out of solid blocks of stone. It is the second oldest fort in Rajasthan. The fort was built by the Maharaja Jazal in 1156 AD or nearly a thousand years ago. Many of the towers and gates were added in the 16th century. Most remarkable of all though is that this is not a museum piece but a living city. About 5,000 people still live within the walls of this massive ancient fort. That has its pluses and minuses. To many historians and preservationists, this is a big problem. The fort, which had stood fierce desert winds and scorching summer temperatures for a thousand years, has begun to shift and in some places crumble over the last 20 years. Many people blame it on the sewage system, which leaks water into the fort's foundations. Increased tourism has accelerated this problem with the water use of hotels, restaurants, and shops. These tourist-oriented businesses add nearly 50,000 gallons of water to the already overburdened system. The sewer system may not be the only factor weakening the walls. Climate change has actually increased the amount of rainfall in this area. 1,000 years ago, the Tar Desert averaged less than 10 inches of rain a year. Today, it is not unusual to get two or three times that much rain. The need for immediate renovation, though, became crystal clear in 2001 when a 7.7 .7 magnitude earthquake hit 200 miles away, cracking the walls in many buildings. The slow decline became an emergency in 2009 when another earthquake hit the region. Though the fort has its challenges, it is a marvel. According to an Indian epic poem, a mystic told Jazal to build here since the Hindu deity Krishna had blessed the location. The hermit said the fort would be nearly invisible to its enemies. Since the walls of the fort are built of local sandstone, they blend into the cliff face. We've admired the outside of the fort long enough. It's time to get inside and see the treasures of the town. The main entrance to the fort is the Aki Pole Gate. The road into the fort's precincts twist and turn, going from one gate only to have to enter through yet another. The multiple gates stand testament to the fortified nature of this town. Many bloody battles were fought along these walls, most notably with the invading Mughals. The first major monument upon entering the inner gates are a series of Jain temples. These temples were built by the very rich and influential Jain community. Though Rajputs, the ruling class in Jaslamir, are not Jains, the financiers were, which gave them considerable power. They received religious freedom and reciprocated by adding a pantheon of Hindu deities, the Rajputs faith, into their temples. There are seven of these exquisite temples built between the 12th and 15th centuries, each dedicated to one of the early prophets of the faith. All are decorated with religious deities, celestial nymphs, and statues of Jain saints. The Jain religion is an ancient religion from India and is dedicated to non-violence to all living things. Today, there are followers in North America, Europe, and the Far East with the largest number still in India, with over 10 million followers. They are strong believers in scholarship and thus have the highest rate of literacy in India. There were 24 of the Jain saints who showed the way to enlightenment through their lives. It is to some of these men that the temples are dedicated. There are several similarities between Jainism and Buddhism, though Jainism preceded Buddhism. Both were founded by a warrior class, yet seek peace. Both believe in reincarnation and working towards an enlightened state. And both do not believe in the caste system. You do not have to understand the intricacies of the Jain religion to admire the craftsmanship of the temples. 
these stone carved edifices make an art lover swoon. Living and working in one of the only inhabited ancient forts in the world can be gratifying in being able to see these incredible monuments like the Jain temples every day. But it also has its challenges. Even with increased annual rainfall, water is a problem that won't go away. The slow deterioration of buildings threatens the very homes that families have lived in for generations. And the city's isolation, what made the city prosper during the Silk Road days, and what makes it an ideal tourist destination, cost the residents economically. Given all the hardships the locals face, they not only endure, but they actually prosper. There has been talk of moving the residents out of the city walls to a more modern, convenient part of Jaslemere, but the residents have fought that idea with zeal. The reason the residents are not willing to take a nicer house with modern facilities is the unique lifestyle they have inside the walls of this ancient marvel. The local markets bring everyday goods like fresh vegetables within easy walking distance, something modern developments lose. The ambiance and history stored within the walls of the homes and businesses could not be replicated in a suburban style redevelopment. But probably, most of all, is the sense of community that is evident inside the fort's walls. As an example, weddings are big events here. Even though many of these people cannot afford a dowry for a traditional wedding, instead, they paint the outside of the house with a Ganesha to let the neighborhood in on the good news. This homey atmosphere translates well for the visitors in shopping opportunities, historic buildings, and unusual encounters. One type of home that's easy for me to understand why the residents don't want to move out is the Havilies. So first of all, what in the world is a Havili? They are basically 18th and 19th century mansions built by wealthy traders. Today, many of them still are lived in by the descendants of these economic giants of yesteryear. In general, they are covered with intricate carvings created by skilled Muslim stone carvers for the Hindu traders. The carvings can be so fine, it appears more like lace than stone. Multiple generations live together with separate women's quarters free from the outsider's eyes. The Havilis are in great shape despite the ravages of time since Jasmere stone carvers are still fine artisans and do regular restoration on the mansions. Many though are taking their skills abroad now to new wealthy clients in the Middle East. Many of the Havilies are open to the public as a way for the family to continue to afford the upkeep. The owners charge a modest entrance fee and may also have a small shop inside. Visit more than one Havili. They are all close to one another since each has its own unique story. One of those most fascinating stories is the dual nature of the Nathmologies Havili. This was probably the last giant Havili constructed in Jasmere before being finished in the middle of the 19th century. This is the best example of fine carving anywhere in India. It was carved by two brothers, each doing one half of the building. The stone block divides the two sides. Though at first glance the two sides look identical, at closer inspection, two distinct personalities emerge. Stars versus flowers. The windows differ. The carved elephants aren't quite the same. The current owner is a descendant of the Nafmal, who had the mansion constructed. The Patwa Havili has its own interesting tale. In 1974, Indira Gandhi visited Jasmine in an attempt to jumpstart tourism. She noticed this Havili and thought that it would be a show place for tourism. But there was a small problem. It was packed in tightly by other buildings, so it was nearly impossible to photograph. That problem was promptly solved by tearing down the buildings across the street, opening up the view. Sometimes I see something that just deserves to be shared for its utter strangeness. This is definitely one of those. 
this man may have the longest mustache in the world. In fact, his father is actually the Guinness Book of World Records holder with a six foot six inch mustache. The son's mustache is four foot six inches long. Now, I must ask, is this something or not? Most normal human beings would be happy just covering Jazzlemere in a day, let alone going on a wildlife safari. But I know the best time to see animals is dawn and dusk, and I'm not getting up before dawn, so off we go. There is quite a bit of wildlife in the desert. In North America, many animals have adapted to the desert. Coyotes, pronghorn, bighorn sheep, and mule deer to name a few. Here in India, there are similar animals, fox, blue bull, and chikara, or Indian gazelle. The first big game we come across is the blue bull, or the nilgiri. Blue bull are the largest member of the antelope family found in India. They do surprisingly well in many environments, from forest to wetlands to desert. Their cow-like appearance has been their friend, since Hindus do not kill cows. Blue bulls have survived the growing human population. The other big animal is the chinkara, or Indian gazelle. These graceful creatures have felt the pressure of man much more than the blue bull. Numbers are dropping due to habitat loss. They are an arid species, so they are less adaptable, and of course hunting. Locals refer to them as deer. They are not true deer since they do have horns, not shedding antlers, but they see them as fair game. My producer promised just one more activity before dinner, and she said that all I would have to do is sit. What she didn't say is that would be sitting on a camel. I may as well make the most of it and impart some of my camel riding knowledge. Well, for those of you that are interested, and I know there's a lot of you out there, I'm gonna demonstrate the proper way to get on a camel. Now remember, this is done only with professionals and it should not be tried at home. First, we climb and stretch over the top of the camel, but that's not the hard part. The hard part comes now. Very yeah. Raise him up. Very that's the hard part. It moves back and forth, back and forth. But once you get on top, it's a smooth sailing from here. They call them the uh, ships of the desert because maybe some people got seasick riding on them. There was a reward though, watching the setting sun from the middle of the tar desert. I'm not complaining. Okay, maybe I am just a little bit, but the producer promised that the camel ride was it. All I wanted was a nice meal and downtime. I had already done more than a day's work, but no, one last task, one last shoot. This one while I wait for my dinner. It is a demonstration on how to cook a Rajasthani chicken dish. To begin this fabulous chicken dish, the chef brings oil to a boil. He adds onion, and then the boneless chicken is put in the pot. Then it sits three to four minutes. The spices are stirred in, red chili, turmeric, coriander, salt, yogurt, and an onion base. Cook for an additional 10 minutes, Add garlic, mix, cover and finish with five more minutes of cooking and it's ready to eat. When I said we'd have an adventure and a half, boy did I mean it. We started out with a little bit of living history at Joslemere Fort, where people still live within the walls of the city. Then it was to the Tar Desert and see how the Rajput people still live out in the desert. And then we went and saw wildlife in what was an inhospitable environment and yet it still thrives. Finally, we learned to cook Rajasthani style. Let's take a look at some of those highlights.
I'm Bill Ball, and I'll see you on the next episode of Journeys in India.